Jules Verne once said, what one man can imagine, other men can do. Wonders that defy my powers of description. The secrets that are mine alone. I would uh, regard uh, Walt Disney as kind of a, a reincarnation of uh, Jules Verne. The Verne phenomenon was very much like people who went to see Fantasia or the early animated features of Disney. I mean, these were things that, you know, everybody's imagination simply opens up to. There were certainly some parallels between what Verne was doing to excite the public in his books and what Disney did. And when you can capture the imagination on a vast scale, you've got, you've got a, a, a major trick up your sleeve. Two men, two centuries. But Walt Disney and Jules Verne both transcended time and space, capturing the popular imagination with stirring visions of technological adventure. I think when we hear uh, the name Jules Verne, uh, we think of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Thanks to the Disney film, probably that's one, one of the reasons why we think of it first, but also from Earth to the Moon, uh, Around the World in 80 Days. All published under the banner of the Extraordinary Voyages. That banner was used on his publications, both fiction and nonfiction, throughout his entire writing career. And generally, one could characterize his writing as being optimistic in nature, with a strong focus on, on technology, a strong sense of adventure, a fascination with uh, the wonders of planet Earth, both inside and out. He would be a massive bestseller in modern terms if he had behind him the technology of, of the publishing industry today. So you would have to compare him with a phenomenon like Stephen King, who is in every newsstand and in every supermarket. The fallout of the Industrial Revolution was science itself. The new technologies, the new things that were allowing us to make all these great new machines, and Verne was very interested in that. Uh, and so notions about maybe we could get to the moon, uh, maybe we could uh, go under the sea, uh, maybe we could explore down to see what was in the middle of the planet. In France, at the time of the American Civil War, there was still a feeling that technology would lead to lots of great effects. And Verne tapped into that, and he became the, the acolyte of that faith. The kind of novel that Verne wrote, um, you call them encyclopedic novels. They were novels that appealed to the middle class because the middle class could read them and feel they were learning something. And Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is a book in which uh, you learn everything there is to know about oceanography. Imagination is one thing, but when you combine it with some scientific basis and technological basis, you really have something. Verne wasn't a scientist, but he fully understood the public's fascination with new technologies of discovery and adventure. His voyage extraordinaire began with five weeks in a balloon, and was quickly followed by journey to the center of the Earth, another international sensation. Almost overnight, the name Jules Verne became synonymous with worlds of wonder and imagination. Verne is still the most reprinted French author of the 19th century. The University of California, Riverside, is home to the world's largest research collection of science fiction and fantasy. Original editions of Verne are among its most valuable holdings. Many, many of these books at this time had rather drab covers. After all, you didn't have all of the graphic design capability that you have today. But this one is really quite extraordinary with its gold rocket ship fired at a gold embossed moon on this. But somehow the iconography of science fiction caught on. Rocket ships, amazing machines, fabulous vehicles, all this sort of thing creates a desire to generate cover art. And this is the first edition of the uh, Around the World in 80 Days, Le Tour du Monde en 80 Jours. Again, profusely illustrated with all kinds of engravings, almost on every three or four pages. As you turn the page, you see many, many, many engravings. Verne's novels were some of the first fully illustrated novels. But the high culture writer like Flaubert wanted no illustrations. Verne wanted profuse illustrations. If I have invented a machine, I want people to know what that machine looks like. One of Verne's most popular novels was From the Earth to the Moon, a story so well imagined that some readers actually believed the trip had taken place. 
Jules Verne was a, a kind of a time traveler. He uh, sent men to the moon long before it happened, and actually he was so nearly accurate that when we first flew to the moon, it was uh, practically from the spot that he had uh, predicted in his story. He chose a launch site less than 100 miles from Cape Canaveral. That's, wow, dead on. He had us going up there basically in a large bullet shot out of a cannon. What's odd is that we now do have people doing experiments with very long cannon as ways of getting small packages into orbit. So eventually the Vernian image will be made true, but you won't be sending people that way. Well, Jacques Offenbach, the composer in 1875, uh, was inspired to base a, um, an operetta on a voyage to the moon. So he composed the music for this, and it was quite an extravaganza. The future was going to be fun. You could sing about it. You could dance to it. Uh, that's an important message. Jules Verne also lived to see a light-hearted film adaptation of his moon voyage by another French visionary, Georges Méliès. Méliès was a magician turned filmmaker. Um, he's credited with having discovered most of the techniques of special effects. And to audiences of 1902, it must have been a marvelous film to see. Even for those who've never seen A Trip to the Moon, everyone knows that wonderful, iconic image of the man in the moon grinning and having his eye pierced by a projectile. In the early part of the 20th century, motion pictures made rapid strides, and Jules Verne's legacy was soon continued on the screen. Well, in 1916, Universal Pictures produced a picture based upon 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. They had perfected a kind of a, of a photosphere, which uh, allowed room for a cameraman and a huge glass. And they shot in the Bahamas, interestingly, near Nassau, because of the clarity of the water and because of the, uh, the, the light. And of course, the audiences were just amazed and astounded because seeing undersea photography was a big deal then. Astounding innovations took place in film technology during the 1920s. Among those who best understood the creative potential of film was a young animator from the Midwest named Walter Elias Disney. Well, Walt Disney, uh, of course, was one of many people who were making animated cartoons in the late 20s. And uh, they were somewhat rough-hewn and simplistic by today's standards. But I would say that Disney, certainly far and above any of the others, had visions, and it was always looking ahead, and what can we do now, and how can we improve? And he always thought about embracing a family audience. He wasn't just after the, the kid market. In fact, he said, you know, my movies are made for the child in perpetuity in all of us. After raising animation to undreamed of heights in the 1930s and 40s, Disney turned his attention to live action films. And he now, thought, let's do a biggie. And he was intrigued by Jules Verne, obviously, because Jules Verne had this imagination which Disney could relate to. He and Walt Disney were both self-taught men who learned a great deal, ma mastered technical material, and brought it to the common man. And there, therefore, they were a natural team to work together across the centuries. However, when we decided to make a picture out of this classic story, we soon discovered that the imagining was much easier to do than the doing. Verne's sprawling narrative posed particular problems for a screenplay. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, if you read it, is not an exciting adventure. It's a fascinating compilation uh, about oceanography in which, here and there, there is about 75 pages of adventure. Shrewd man that he was, Disney would uh, seize on the elements that he thought would appeal to a vast number of people. He had it Esmeralda the trained seal, who of course was not in Verne and had some slapstick moments. He added a song, A Whale of a Tale, which needless to say was not in the original. Got a whale of a tale to tell you lads, a whale of a tale or two, about the flapping fish and the girls I've loved. A nice but perhaps the film's biggest challenge was to convincingly portray Verne's enigmatic anti-hero, Captain Nemo. Captain Nemo, you know, is neither a villain nor hero, uh, which is what makes him interesting because he is a complex character. With Captain Nemo, it's not really a mad scientist, it's a mad politician. 
Uh, it's somebody who has a social vision, a vision of the way the world ought to be, but it's too dangerous. Disney knew that that character had to be a solid actor. In fact, he had been thinking of Ralph Richardson, the British actor. And he knew that he just couldn't get somebody. He wanted a person of some substance and depth to play this character. And James Mason was marvelous in that picture. Imagine what would happen if they controlled machines such as this submarine boat. Far better that they think there's a monster and hunt me with harpoons. Captain Nemo's uh, mode of transportation was probably about the coolest thing anybody's ever seen anywhere, and that's the Nautilus, of course. Jules Verne's original Nautilus was a smooth, futuristic vehicle, but to convey a sense of the 19th century to mid-20th century audiences, the Disney Nautilus, designed by Harper Goff, was an ironic combination of the new and the old. It's very speedy, very swift, very 50s. You know, you, it really does have, like the cars, tail fins on it. Well, the Nautilus is first described as a sea monster that's ravaging the ships in the Pacific and uh, we ultimately discover that it's not a monster at all, it's truly a submersible ship. The real strength of Harper Goff's design of the Nautilus is really in its Victorian aspect. It looks very much like an artifact of its time. Verne had the vision to see that electricity was the only way to drive a submarine under the water where you couldn't simply burn up your air with the standard fossil fuel. So he had, uh, but didn't describe, this source of electricity, which we now know had to be a nuclear reactor. Eighty-four years earlier, Verne's novel was a publishing phenomenon. Now it was one of the most eagerly awaited films produced by Hollywood. I didn't know really what I was going to see. I wasn't sure, and I just, I was blown away. I mean, as soon as that, that screen opened and it was in Cinemascope, I just went, wow. And then when you first saw that boat, you know, the submarine and stuff, I was hooked from there on. And those were the days where you could stay in the theater. And I, I, sat, I sat there and I saw the film three times. You had a beautifully orchestrated campaign going on. And as a result, the interest in this film, even before it opened, was considerable. 20,000 Leagues is a great science fiction film because it takes Verne in his essence uses the plot, but makes you see it wholly new. Here's a film that, coming out of the era of Ben-Hur and all these other big spectacle films, can do this with science fiction. You know, you don't have to do low-budget films. It doesn't have to be a secondary genre in the cinema industry. It can be something that will go right to the front of the box office. Verne was content to create his extraordinary worlds on paper. Walt Disney dreamed of making them real. Disney was the same kind of visionary, very interested in technology, mastered many technical tricks, and then carried them forward in something nobody had envisioned, theme parks. You could go visit these frontiers. You could go on the moon trip at Disneyland. You could, you could visit the future. Disneyland then was wondrous because, of course, nobody had ever seen anything like it. And it gave you the experience. It was not just about looking at exhibits, it was about taking rides. Like Jules Verne, one ride that particularly interested Walt Disney was a trip into outer space. One of man's oldest dreams has been the desire for space travel, to visit other worlds. Until recently, this idea seemed impossible. But great new discoveries have brought us to the threshold of a new frontier. He loved space exploration. And so when Disneyland first opened, they had a trip to the moon. Now this will give you a pretty good idea of the rocket ship in which you will soon be traveling to the moon. You sat around in a big circle, and they had all these chairs and vibrators, which was really cool. And you saw the, the Earth leaving in the bottom scope. You'd look at the screen, it would drop away, and then you'd see you know, the stars, everything come in, and then you would actually head to the moon. The Verne-Disney connection is long and lasting. Disney adapted another popular Verne novel, In Search of the Castaways. A Verne-inspired airship was prominently featured in Island at the Top of the World. And 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is a major theme park attraction at Tokyo Disney Seas and Disneyland Paris. But perhaps the strongest link between Disney and Verne is the sheer sense of wonder both men communicated to an eager public. I mean, we all have sense of wonder, and as kids do, and 
old geezers like me do and still do. You love Sense of Wonder. You love to see things that, that you've never seen before. Disney's impact on the 20th century is immense. You can argue that he is the foremost cultural figure. The Disney films uh, tend to be a great repository of imagery that move through the society, and there's no way that we can avoid it, nor should we avoid it. He had the gift for reaching all humanity, and no other filmmaker has that reach. I think that his alliance with Verne will last a very long time because visions of the future, in a strange sense, do not date. There may be somebody in this 21st century who does things with these materials, both Disney's and Verne's, that are new in a medium we don't even know, maybe virtual reality or something, and they will make it fresh again because the expansion of human horizons will not end. And singing that song will remain a major cultural statement, probably forever.